so much. It's my pleasure uh, today to uh, present uh, our speaker, Daniel Fisher. Uh, I met Daniel a few times uh, in China with him, and it was always a pleasure because uh, he's really one of the broadest people in science that I've interacted with. And I always learn something new uh, from our interactions. We uh, have experience in many different areas of uh, research, from uh, nonlinear uh, dynamics, uh, dynamical system, to uh, statistical physics, and more, most recently in biophysics. And even in biophysics, he has covered or worked in several different areas, including uh, immunology and what we can talk about today, the evolutionary dynamics. Uh, uh, Daniel got his undergraduate degree at the uh, Cornell. After that, he moved to Harvard uh, with shortstop at Cambridge. Did his PhD with uh, uh, Alpern at Harvard. After that, he got a position at Bell Labs at the time. He moved to uh, physics department Princeton, from Princeton to Harvard again as a faculty. And then finally, in 2000, since 2007, he's been at Stanford. So please, uh, let's welcome him. Uh, It's nice to be back here. I think the last time I was here was before the majority of the people in the room were born. Right? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, that's showing that I'm at my age. Let's see. Is there a pointer? Um, um, yeah. Well, hey, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. So, so the title of this um, talk is a question, and in fact, one of the main purposes is going to be, you know, sort of raising uh, questions and trying to raise a uh, 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 more pointed one. Um, and the, the basic uh, um, you know, starting point is that the facts of evolution have been known for um, uh, a very long uh, for a time. The theory of evolution, the basics of the theory are more than 150 years old. So even if we were string theorists, we would just say, okay, everything was done. We know the basic laws, you know, everything else just follows from, uh, um, from that. But the problem with the laws of evolution is they're much too general. Is that anything can involve a principle. I said it's a dynamical process and numbers really matter. Right? For a bacteria to evolve antibiotic resistance can take less than an hour in the lab. Okay? A, spontaneous, a cell forming spontaneously from nothing could happen if you waited long enough. But of course, that's some ridiculously long time one has to wait. So somewhere in between there are things which are more or less likely to occur, and some which have occurred, and what would, would occur on repeated times, presumably if one re-ran re the table of, uh, table of life. Um, so the kinds of questions one would you know, like to oh, ask, the quantitative questions of what determines the rates of evolution, of course, we really like things like original origin of life, but even on much narrower um, and shorter time scales, and that's what I'll, I'll focus on. Then something about some of the important processes, particularly the role of sex or more generally of genetic, uh, of genetic state. And then one which I won't get to, but it's sort of one of my main things I will say now, is trying to understand why there's so much diversity on all, uh, on all scales. So what has made this a um, good time to uh, work on this uh, problem? Well, that's the incredible advances in DNA um, sequencing. This is on a log scale, and this curve is Moore's, uh, Moore's law, so it's much faster than that. And it's gone from being a billion dollars to sequence the human genome the first time to being able to sequence the human genome accurately enough to tell the difference between that person's genome in a cancer cell and a non-cancer cell for a quarter of a thousand volts. Okay. So this is an amazing, uh, amazing advance. And one can then measure a lot of things beyond measuring, say, the, the sequence of one in, uh, of, uh, of some species. You can measure the diversity within the species, look at the statistical properties. One can do DNA sequencing from single cells, so look at variables within a, uh, um, within a person, say. One can look at the dynamics of evolution. Right? The evolution is intrinsically a dynamical pro a process, but almost all the evidence for evolution is snapshots, right? looking at extant organisms and inferring their histories. I'm from them, but not actual dynamics directly. But now we can follow the dynamics, both in the lab, in epidemics, and in individual, uh, um, um, in, in individual humans. Theory. One of the problems with evolution is that doing simulations of models is much too easy. This very general phenomena, right? And so very general phenomena means you can find things that evolve in models and get interesting things out. But it's too hard, very hard, to learn what one, has, what one is learning general. So you can do things, if you make nice pictures, you can get them on the cover of Nature or other glossy magazines. Um, but um, to really learn things from them is much uh, harder. What do we want? Well, we really like to have some simple models with some key features. But of course, we have to know what we mean by key features. And there's a lot of art, uh, um, art in that, but hopefully something we can bring from physics. 
Then one would like to have some robust understanding, is really understanding what features are that matter and which ones don't. And quantitatively, what are the key, um, uh, the key parameters? And one has to then be able to extrapolate over some of the very large and very small numbers, which I'll come to, that come in all of the evolutionary processes, even things you can follow in real time in the, uh, um, in the lab. Because there are fundamental difficulties that there are multiple levels on which the evolution takes place, multiple time scales, all kinds of complex feedbacks. And you know, a basic question is, can we predict anything quantitatively? Okay, and to, you know, to zero with order, when we sort of started on this, one would almost said no, that there was almost no non-trivial thing that could be predicted uh, quantitatively. That's being a bit unfair to the state of the, the field. But it turned out to be rather difficult to go, um, to go beyond that, and I'll say a little bit of progress in, in one, um, one context. Well, if you want to be able to understand evolution, you have to take something which is going to be able to do, look at it in a lot of different ways. And you basically have to learn a lot of bacteria or the microbes. Um, they're tiny, the genomes are small, um, they reproduce fast, you can manipulate them in all kinds of ways, probe cut them in all kinds of ways. And there's an enormous amount of diversity. If you just look in your own mouth, you will find tens of different phyla, some of which are only known from a representative from some hot springs in Yellowstone. But you can get the sequences from them through your mouth. People will quote some number like 10 to the 8 species. That's rather meaningless. But then you can look at a low level within a species. So this is a species of an extremely important um, organism, Prochlorococcus. It's a cyanobacterium. It's responsible for most of photosynthesis in the uh, um, um, nutrient-poor parts, um, uh, parts of the ocean. Um, and there's a lot of diversity within that that's been tracked by um, Penny Chisholm's group, which should be, name should have been, um, uh, have been on it. Now, this organism plays a special role, a cyanobacteria, is that what's responsible for oxygen in the atmosphere? They would want to produce the oxygen. Without them, um, all of the organisms that think they're important, namely humans, um, would not even exist. We couldn't possibly exist because there's not enough energy for things that move around without having the oxygen. So the cyanobacteria is a group of the most important of organisms. And I sometimes say that if I were the creator and had sort of triggered the origins of, uh, of life and it got going and there were cells and things, and they are kind of bored after a while, nothing seemed to be happening, and I you know, would allow myself one little tiny invention, I would do an inorganic invention, an intervention, which was to make a little cluster of uh, manganese, calcium, and oxygen, which is the, um, at the heart of the uh, photosynthesis for uh, breaking down uh, uh, water, which makes the hydrogen uh, oxygen. Um, so this I'm going to um, say some um, uh, more things about in a bit, but it's one of the nice examples of where there's a lot of diversity which is sort of puzzling because they all mix together, they all compete with each other in the ocean, so you would think the survival of the fittest would say the best one should win, so why are there so many um, slightly different, um, um, different types? And that's then really there is true on all, all, all schemes. The problem though is it's very easy to probe diversity with the genotype, so looking at the sequences, but it's much harder to probe the diversity, the level of the properties of organisms, because we don't know what those correspond to. So you can sort of track it, but you don't know what it's going to be. Uh, uh, really. So with bacteria, there are lots of large and small numbers. If you don't like bacteria, you should remember that there are more bacteria cells in your body than there are of your, of your own cells. Um, they are rather important to your health as well as uh, vice versa. The number of Prochlorococcus, the bacteria I just mentioned, is about 10 to the 27. So it's a very large, uh, a very large number. Now, normally, if people will, um, uh, evolution biologists, and you will sort of you know, say, okay, I've become a physicist, I'd like to know numbers, I'm kind of puzzled and amazed by how much evolution complexity evolution has produced and how much diversity has been produced. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's been a very long time. Life has been around a very long time. Okay, so that's clearly one big number is associated with the age of the Earth. But then I'll ask, well, but supposing the Earth were a thousand times as long, supposing the radiochemists and the geophysicists who are responsible for us knowing the age of life, um, that they realized they've been using different units and when um, and then uh, got together and corrected those units and said, well, actually they've discovered that life is really 10 to the 12th years old rather than 10 to the 9th, would that bother you? And the honest evolutionary biologists you know, I've talked about is they think, no, we don't understand evolution to within three orders of magnitude as far as time scale. But there's another way we can ask the question is supposing the Earth were a thousand times smaller but had a similar diversity of environments, would my evolution have um, receded a similar level of diversity and complexity and so on from that? So that's a question of asking not how long the time is, but how many individuals there are that could have evolutionary innovation. So that comes to the question of the number of bacteria on Earth, which is an enormous number. 10 to the 29th is on the conservative side. If you look as far as the number of evolution experiments ever done by bacteria, in other words, how many different bacteria were ever, ever lived, 
um, the portion of the edge of the Earth, that's up in the either the 100 range, 10 to the 39 or somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat big. And you'll notice that on a log scale, most of that big number is coming from the size of the Earth. It's coming from the number of bacteria that are alive now, rather than how many, how many generations have been. Right? So it's not at all clear which is the relevant big number or what the relevant combination is. If you think that evolution is driven by extremely rare events, they're certainly important for some parts, then the, the crucial number would be this product. Now, interesting, the same is true for vertebrates. If you ask about the vertebrate evolution, and you ask about how long vertebrates have been around in generations, and you ask about how many vertebrates there are that exist at any given time, again, the product of those on a log scale is dominated by the total number that are around at any time. So the number of sort of evolution experiments done by vertebrates is uh, also dominated by the size of the Earth. What about sizes of genomes? Well, bacteria genomes are on the order of millions of uh, bases, with some of them arranged. As against ours, where the important parts of hundreds of millions or maybe a billion bases, very low mutation rates, recombination rates for exchanging DNA between bacteria can vary all over the place. I'll come, uh, come back to that. Are these numbers big or small? I mean, what do I compare these numbers to? You know, is this number amount of DNA? Is that, should I be surprised that something of the complexity of the cell can come from that? or something of the complexity of a human can come from just tens of thousands of, uh, of genes. I think nobody knows what one should be surprised by our lack of understanding isn't. One of the things that, of course, is important is how much you know, evolution can potentially explore. And this is the, the size of the genome is certainly important um, here. So one can ask how many possible the domains are there. So this is a little functional part of a, uh, a single protein. And supposing that's 30 amino acids long, sort of typical size. Then the number of possible such domains is 20 to the 30th, which is about 10 to the 39. So it means that every time there's a new evolution experiment by a divided cell, there is a um, new protein and domain tried out. It would have only explored all of the 30 amino acids. Right? So there's a huge number of, uh, of possibilities and a huge amount of possible redundancy, which is potential. But basically, we have no idea what numbers uh, matter. Now, since I'm a theoretical a physicist, and this is a physics colloquium, I should show at least one slide with some honest um, uh, equations um, on them. So this is looking at the evolutionary um, uh, dynamics. If I have a genome, the alpha, the number of individuals, n alpha, and a quantity which is always talked about, and in many ways is misleading as I'll come to, which is the fitness, which in at least a simple definition, is this the difference between the birth and the death rate. Um, and so it's the growth rate of the population that I have dynamics for the population of growing exponentially with rate on the fitness. And then there's mutations, which can give rise to other ones. And then there's fluctuation parts to do birth and death uh, fluctuation. But the problem is, is that this fitness depends on all the other populations around, on time, on space, and so on, and all of biology and everything else. So this is like many body Schrodinger's equation. It's totally general, but absolutely useless. Okay, so you should ignore this quickly. Um, if you want to make life more interesting, then you include the effects of sex, which is recombining genomes that can be very different from each other instead of making small changes to existing genomes. And then things get even more complicated. So to do anything useful at all, we have to go and try to make look at simple models or at least simple contexts. So the simplest is to look at asexual evolution, so no genetic exchange, in a constant environment. So in this case, the fitness depends only on the genome. Um, and there's no ecology, no interactions, except from competition that keeps the total population size fixed. So this is sort of like a mean field uh, um, a competition. No spatial structure, everything can do with everything else. And then we can think of a fitness landscape, which is the fitness as a function of the genome. And the growth rate on um, birth minus death rate is just going to be the fitness of yourself measured with respect to the average of the population. Do you do better or worse than the average population? You know, if there's no mutations, the one with the highest phi alpha will take over the population, surviving with the uh, um, Okay, so what happens if I have a large population? Well, then I can have many mu um, beneficial mutations that can come in. These compete and add to each other and so on. And we can ask a very simple um, question. Given some statistical properties of the fitness landscape, how does the rate of increase of the fitness of the population, average of the population, depend on the quantities like the, um, the population size, the mutation rates, and statistical properties of the landscape? And then we can ask how we can characterize the diversity in that population that will occur because I can get different mutations in this coming from. So that's now a question which you could say, okay, this is an ideal theorist question. You can say your biology friends will give you the fitness of the function of the genome, tell you mutation rates, and then you just go ahead and calculate. But let's again, we want to simplify things so we can actually try to do this. 
So let's look at the simplest possible landscape. This is just a fitness uh, staircase. Each mutation um, is going to increase the fitness by one. We're going to ignore bad mutations. We'll have good mutations. Increase the fitness by uh, um, S. And I can just keep going. We're theorists, so this is just an infinite staircase. And our genome is just strings of zeros and ones. And the fitness is just a number of ones times the coefficient S. Only beneficial mutations at low rate, which is almost always true, and a fixed total population size. So this model only has three parameters. It's got N, M, and S. One of them just sets the units of time, so basically it's two-dimensional parameters. So a really simple question then is, if I look at the population as a whole, how will this population move up this staircase <coughs> with the mutations under the mutation and selection? What will be its average speed? What will be the distribution of the population over the different steps in there? And fluctuations of the other properties of what's going on. So this is asking about the problem of ascending this fitness step. In a small population, or relatively small, as long as the number of mutations per generation is small, most of the time I will just be sitting, the population is sitting on one step on the staircase. Then one individual in that population will get a good mutation. It'll step up to the next step. Then it'll, of course, grow rapidly. And it's ascending grow rapidly, so it'll then take over the population. It'll all get up to the next step. And then one will go on to the next step, which is too high for me to stand on. And um, it'll keep going. So it'll basically sort of go up one step at a time, then pause, go up another step, and so on. So this is a classical situation in which most theory is done in this machine. In this situation here, the rate at which the population goes up the staircase, the rate of increase in the fitness, is limited by mutations. So this is really, it's a population time times the mutation rate that's setting the rate of the uh, evolution. So that's a sort of obvious set of parameters that comes up. That comes but what happens if I go to the other limit, where I've now got before the population on step one has taken over, some individuals have gone to step two before they've taken over, some have gone up to step three, and so on. So in that case, I have to look at how the population is spread out over many steps on the staircase. So this is now looking at many steps. It's looking at the population on each step as a function on a log scale, so it's very poorly distributed. So the ones down here, they're below average, they're dying out. They're less fit than average. The ones by here are about average, not changing much. The ones here are the highest step occupied, and they're growing rapidly. And then there's mutations that are feeding the higher steps. These <coughs> mutations here don't matter much. There's already a lot of individuals there. But these mutations here that go on to the first unoccupied step, they're very important. Right? Those are the ones which, if we turned off mutations afterwards, these would take off the population rate. So the mutations coming out of this nose of the distribution, the hybrid's nose are the most important one. And because that's intrinsically a very stochastic process, this is very strongly fluctuating. And this is where the mutations come. Then after these have come up, these populations grow, and this whole fitness distribution moves along at some speed v, which is determined between the balance of the selection act on the bulk of the population and the uh, mutations acting up at the nose. Most of the population, this growth is only to lower the grade point average. Right? The evolution cares about the A students mutating into A plus students, and, the, um, and these ones, they're, they're all going to die out anyway, but they hold the grade point average down. Um, none of the three institutions at which I've been a professor does this work very well. We don't include bad mutations. So, so it turns out with big populations, the bad mutations don't matter much. Because the ones with bad mutations, they always die out. It's sort of like in a, in a very growing economy, you know, thankfully fail, things don't do well, it doesn't matter so much. If everything sort of gets static, there's not much potential for doing better, then it matters much more. So my cohort populations, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter too much. So what is this going to be? Well, this will give us a dependence on the, um, uh, on the, the rate of mutation, which has no well-defined thermodynamic limit, right? This is this, the first thing we try to do is take an infinite limit. That doesn't exist. An infinite and the population just races up and keeps accelerating. Okay? Well, instead we get something which only logarithmically depends on the population size and mutation. But the thing to note here is that the combination n times m, which is the rate of producing mutations, that doesn't come in at all. These get separated out. So it wasn't even obvious from the sort of simple analysis which combinations of parameters would come in. Okay, one ends up with this very weak dependence on, the, uh, on both the population size and mutation. So Michael Desai, who is um, his thesis um, work, this, uh, um, this was, had already been various statistical physicists working on it uh, um, uh, previously, he went off for a summer project to do, a, um, to do some experiments to try to look at this dependence of uh, rate of asexual evolution on population size and mutation rate in Andrew Murray's lab. 
Um, it ended up taking several years, and he became a fantastic experimentalist and is now a professor of biology at, uh, at, uh, at Harvard. Um, and this was an experiment of looking at evolving yeast and low glucose, and I don't want to go into any of them details of it, but basically you looked at the rate of increase of the fitness as a function of this combination n times the mutation rate, single site one, the sort of traditional um, uh, uh, theory would have said this, and the, um, uh, the, the more sophisticated theory on the staircase says this, and the data of the points are in there, and then he actually was able to measure distributions of fitness in the population, so this is like the distribution I was just showing on different steps on the staircase, except it isn't a staircase, and so this is on a linear scale. Okay. So, rather embarrassingly, the theory verified the predictions. Okay. So, if we were, um, you know, uh, sensible, we would have just <coughs> advertised this and um, sent it to uh, Gothi uh, magazine without talking about the caveat. Um, the problem is, the theory is definitely wrong, right? Firstly, all there are a lot of different mutations. There are deleterious mutations, bad <coughs> ones. The, the steps aren't all the same height. There are many different... Uh, um, a mutation possible, and so on. So all the assumptions of when the theory are clearly wrong. Okay? So we don't expect this to be right, and so either there's something more deep um, going on, or we, were just, uh, um, or we were just lucky. But this really does take one and force one to think about it more, um, uh, more seriously. Okay? So this is now going to turn out to be something which took a lot of time to understand uh, better. It's something a bit like magnetism, where you can, Ising model is a beautiful description of certain properties of magnets, even though it has nothing to do, and its parameters have nothing to do with the microscopic parameters in a magnet. That's even more true here, and there are certain <coughs> amounts of features that we now understand which will be general, even though the model is completely wrong. In your previous slide, uh, uh, the S variable is wrong. So the S is just the um, increase in the, each step up the, up the landscape increases the fitness by S. So one population will grow faster by e to the st. So it's a unit of yeah, this is units of improvement. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, okay. so what we realized after the theory had sorry. What does the negative number mean? Where? Sorry. Um, so here. Yeah. On here. Yeah. This is fitness relative to the mean. So there's a distribution of fitness relative to the relative to the mean. So, yeah. Um, um, okay, so what we um, realized that fact sometime afterwards was the interesting thing of, in these kinds of experiments, and in this problem generally, was not how fast the fitness moved up the, the hill. That was something which depends on all kinds of details. The model's not getting right anyway. But the, there were some features which turned out much more general, which is what the statistics look like of the diversity. So what's the diversity? Well, I've got a population now, say, I'm sitting on the top step. Okay? But this population, they're all the same fitness, but they're not identical because some of them have a different sets of zeros and ones. So I've got these subpopulations there. They're all growing up at the same rate. And then some of those produce mutations to go up onto the next uh, step on the, uh, um, on the staircase. And this one's lucky produced two. This one didn't produce any. This one produced some and so on. Okay? And then this process continues, and these produce some and so on. So in order to be successful, you not only have to be high fitness, but you have to produce mutations to even higher fitness. And then your, those descendants have to produce mutations to be the higher fitness and so on. So you have to keep going along, and your descendants have to stay at the nose of this uh, distribution in order to continue to be successful. But this process then gives rise to statistical properties of diversity, which eventually, when these populations grow up enough to dominate the population, they will give the things you can measure in the, uh, um, in the population. Now, these distributions are something which physicists are not usually comfortable. They have infinite mean, but they're d distributions which have nice, uh, um, nice properties. So how come one try to track this? And this is now some of the black magic of, uh, um, of modern uh, genomics. And this was done by um, uh, Sasha Levy um, and um, Gavin uh, Sherlock's lab and Jamie Blundell did the really um, understanding of theory and analysis for this. So this is a part of a general um, uh, maxim now, is that as in physics, it certainly used to be true, if you wanted to measure something well, you turn it into a frequency and measure the frequency. Here now, with biology, if you want to measure something, you turn it into a DNA sequencing measurement and do the sequencing. Because it's so cheap. Okay. So this is done by taking yeast cells, putting barcodes, a random bit of DNA in each, in each of them, and then uh, these barcodes are a string of letters represented by the colors, um, uh, colors there. And then you grow those up in the population. So you have a families of barcodes. All of the descendants of the blue cell have the same um, barcode in it. Um, as they grow, if some of them are better than others, if they get a mutation and do better, there'll be more of those. 
And then you just throw it all in the sequence, so the whole population in the sequencer, and you just read this region, and you see you get you know, four reads of this, eight reads of that, and whatever, and you can make a uh, um, uh, measure how many of our descendants are the blue ones, how many descendants are the, the uh, yellow ones. So this was the first experiments on this were done, where there were 500,000 barcoded, uh, barcoded cells. And this is now on a log scale of looking at those down every uh, eight, uh, eight generations. Um, and there's too many curves on here to, to see. The important ones to notice are the ones up near the top. And you notice some of these start coming up linearly. It's on a log scale, so that exponentially in time. And those are ones that have picked up a good mutation and are then coming up and taking over the population. These are ones that are going extinct because they're not doing, uh, not doing as well. Each line here is one barcode. Each line here is one barcode, yeah. And so there's half a million lines, um, the, uh, but they're not all showing. <laughs> um, okay. So this, um, you, can, you can follow this for a while. This takes quite a bit of sequencing, roughly one human genome's worth per time point, but this is not an expensive experiment. This is what can be done uh, I'm readily, I'm readily now. Then what we can actually do is pull out some of the mutants later, and you can study them in various ways. And so, on. so this is very early stage of evolution. But then what can happen if you kept doing this was one barcode could start taking over the population, and you kind of lose information. And so you would like to way, have ways of getting information about what's going on in the population without having to track the descendants of one individual. So instead of that, you can try to directly track the mutations that have come in. Okay, so this you can also do from sequencing the whole population, but there's no barcode now. You're just taking the whole genome, chopping it up into little pieces of a few hundred, uh, few hundred bases, and reading many times from each sequence. So we have one little bit of the genome here. We're reading it a very large number of times. Okay. So we look at that, so we're each time one of these is coming from a different cell, and you see most of the cells here have A's at this site, a few have G's, and a few have a C at that site. And so this gives us a, an estimate of the frequencies of those variants in the population. If I start with a population which is identical, then they'll be the same almost everywhere, and there'll be a few sites at which they differ from each other. The problem is if I do this somewhere else in the genome, I see some other um, site here where, which is variable, but I don't know which of these are connected to which of those. I've lost linkage information. I don't know the correlation. Nevertheless, this is a way that one can follow these. And you can follow them for a long time. And this has been done by um, in Rich, Lensky's, uh, Rich Lensky's group. So these E. coli have been evolved for 60,000 generations, which is 25 years. And when Rich Lensky started these experiments, not only could he have not been able to do what's been able to be done now, he couldn't have even imagined it. Okay, so I got to know him somewhere about in here, and then by, for a very brief time, I was an expert on sequencing and what could be done, and already there was starting to be a clue as to what you could do already at that stage, but then all of the stuff done, done here, I think, I don't think anyone could have even, um, even imagined. So this is reading from the whole population, and each of these lines is showing a particular mutation that has shown up at some time, that wasn't in the ancestor, and then these come up and take over the population. Well, not all of them. Some of them come up and then die out. Die out again. What's going on there? This would be out-competed by another one that's come in and done better. And then they come over, and you notice initially a lot come up. They're sort of finding many ways to do, to do better, and the fitness is increasing by quite a lot. Then after some time, the meds start being fewer of them. They tend to come up sort of clumped together, which is kind of weird, but it turns out <laughs> that's one of the things predicted by the theory that these tend to come up in uh, clusters. And then another strange thing is if you look at very long times, you find the rate at which these are coming up and how fast they're coming up is not that different than what we're looking here. <coughs> okay. So this at least superficially suggests as if when it's coming at long, these very long times in a, this environment which is supposed to be staying constant, the experiment just reproducing itself from one day to the next, that it, when it's somehow getting a continual evolution in an environment which is constant, which goes completely contrary to what one's um, intuition would be, and also people would say, is that if you're in a constant environment, you know, eventually there's going to be the fittest. And okay, you won't get to the fittest, but you'll get closer and closer and slow down and slow down. It's not clear yet whether this is more slowing down or other things um, um, or not. Um, it's hard to do the experiments uh, um, uh, uh, precisely. There's also something going on in here, something interesting in there. The nice thing at this stage is the theory is good enough so the interesting features can show up by disagreements with the theory. Right? And for example, say these things that are clustering, that would have never um, you know, known that kind of thing would have uh, been the thing you'd expect. 
And so the things like this that goes on is telling you something else is going on. Which I'll come back. So what is the connection of any of this to, to nature? Okay, this is idealized evolution, no ecology, interacting with organisms, no spatial structure, no time dependence, no limit how evolved, and so on, and no genetic exchange. Is it useful understanding kind of thing? So here's a, uh, um, um, an example, at this point I think the nicest example, by Richard Nair and collaborators. This is looking at evolution of HIV in individual patients, where by now some have been tracked over 20 years, and you can go back and sequence the, and sequence the, um, sequence the sample. This is looking at the frequencies of individual uh, um, mutations, like I had uh, um, um, uh, here. So we're looking at frequency of mutations in the, in the whole uh, population. Um, and um, the, on a log scale, so there's a frequency on a log scale and the number of sites in the genome with those frequencies. The traditional theoretical prediction would be this uh, curve here, that almost none of this evolution is doing anything interesting. The continual evolution theory represented in this curve here, and then these various um, experimental um, data are ones which are to different degrees of conservation, which take quite a lot to explain, uh, explain this. But these ones here, these colors, are rather close to this, and certainly much closer than they are to the conventional. So what's going on here? The conventional view of this population, which is actually the conventional view of a lot of evolution, is that there's a lot of mutations that happen that don't do it. Neutral mutations. Um, some of them don't change amino acids, some do, but they don't happen. And then occasionally something big happens. In the case of HIV, something big means it learns to beat the immune system or can beat a drug. Okay? And most of the evolution that you would see is all neutral. And that would give a prediction for the diversity which is like this. The other prediction, the other scenario, is that the HIV is always competing very strongly with other HIV. And so they're fighting like crazy with each other, but it, they're not changing how they affect the host until one of them happens to get to a particular genome such that some mutation on that can then make it be the immune system or something like that, and then you can get sort of a big effect. Okay. But the evolution is always continuing, they're fighting with each other, and that's what this, would, this model would be roughly appropriate for, and that would give you this, uh, um, uh, this curve. But how would they be competing against each other without affecting the host? Because they're just which ones, which ones affect the cells, which ones affect the cells, how many virions they produce right, so when they come out of the cell. The, the virus is chased, they have to kill the cell and go mm -hmm. Right, but they, they have to grow better in the cell than other ones do. Right? So they, they're killing the cells, so they're affecting they're the host. The they're affecting the host, but the ones that are doing better are not affecting the host differently than the ones that are doing worse. Oh, I see. Right? So it's, it's, their, it's them competing with each other without the host noticing the difference. Much. And then occasionally something happens. OK, so this is a hint that there might be some kind of universality of some of these uh, um, phenomena in asexual well-mixed populations. Flu, uh, globally, the global evolution of flu, also there seem to be some features which have some aspects of, uh, of this. And so this is sort of the first hint that some of the ideas that came up in toy models, then um, thinking about um, uh, experiments, that might at least have some hints of what's going on in the real world, and certainly give one some ideas as to scenarios that are different than the, than the traditional tradition. So now I want to change some gear and come to some of the, the things and processes involved in, in uh, evolution. Sexual evolution is much harder to um, understand, both theoretically and on some very simple, uh, um, uh, simple <coughs> operations. Sex can be very costly. There's a lot of uh, um, machinery needed, but also there's an enormous disadvantage of having uh, um, uh, males. If there were 50% males in a population, as with humans, then each female has to on average give birth to one male and one female for her descendants to stay um, uh, roughly the same level in the population. But if there were no males or a very small number of males, then if each female gives birth to two, her descendants will double in size every generation of population. So there's a huge disadvantage to having uh, um, at least sex when you have a 50-50 ratio of males to uh, males to females. So there are better be some big benefits to counter, uh, um, counteract. The old pessimist will say it's uh, uh, purging bad genes. I think uh, most people would say that some aspects of speeding of evolution, diversification, maintenance variation, some set of words, but words without numbers associated with them, so you have no idea which are dominant effects, or even the sign of effects, um, and particularly this bringing together the favorable, um, favorable combination. So there's, of course, various uh, trade-offs, oh, but here's bringing together some communists. This actually then immediately brings us to a question about the trade-offs. 
Right? So this, the short-term trade-off, which I just showed, is that if you look at number of great grandchildren, <coughs> it would definitely pay for females to be um, uh, reproduced parthenogenetically. Um, so that's a short-term evolution of the country. Then there's avoiding extinction. Right? If you all get wiped out by some pathogen at some point, you've got extinct. And then there's evolution is excess on a long term, like insects. Insect species go extinct regularly, probably much faster than mammalian species. But as a group, insects are tremendously successful. So in answering any of the questions about fitness, you know, what does it mean? One has to absolutely think about the time scales, and then one has to, you know, really of course think about the world. So bacteria don't have sex like uh, um, like we do. They occasionally change a little <coughs> bit of change a little bit of DNA between uh, um, uh, between bacteria. Um, and so we would like to ask how much of that um, uh, exchange is, a nut, is needed to make the evolution substantially faster? It's an easy question to ask. We were talking about rates of evolution, speed of evolution, how much recombination will change that uh, um, substantially. So again, we would like a simple, a simple model. And here, we'll look at a simple model, which is going to be like a two-dimensional version of our staircase. It's a two-dimensional fitness uh, staircase. Each individual has two chromosomes. They can get mutations on each. And then they can do, they can exchange chromosomes, but no recombination with it. So it's basically, the evolution is on a two-dimensional um, uh, fitness uh, um, um, landscape. Um, for the staircase, I would like to ask how the uh, evolution of kind of recombination. But what one finds is that it seems to go logarithmically, dependent on the mutation rate, and roughly speaking, there's a um, scaling function. Um, such that the, um, for, um, yeah, sorry. for um, the bigger the population is, the less recombination you need to make a difference. So what does this mean? This means if I take a very big population, a small amount can make a tiny difference. So amounts that you can't even measure in the lab, and you think they're not having recombination, but if that amount is there in nature, in big populations, it can already matter. What's, the, what's this uh, figure here? Uh, what's this is showing the ratio of the speed of the evolution relative to asexual speed. Right, so this is, it starts at one um, when it's purely asexual and goes up to two when the chromosomes are evolving separately. Um, and um, yeah, and the crucial thing is here that it's a log a variable scale in this. Now unfortunately, this process is incredibly complicated. It's actually, a, it goes into a solitary state with alternating phases of, of um, recombination and mutation dominating. And we never would have expected that something as simple as this two-dimensional model could produce anything so complicated. Some of the features that are in here are probably there for more realistic models um, um, as well. But um, it's, it, this shows some of the complexities and how difficult it is to try to understand the effects of recombination. And that's still our understanding that is very limited as it, even for toy models, never mind for um, things relevant for the real world. So another important uh, part of uh, um, sex is that bringing together and breaking apart mutations which are um, can be good um, together but bad individually. Right? So that's one of the things if I have some mutations both you know, bring them together. And then for evolution, I've already said, it's the rare good things that really matter. So even if most of the times when you make two individuals from a big population, their offspring do worse, if occasionally some of those made offspring do better, then that can dominate the uh, uh, evolution. So the sex can combine good mutations, but it can also separate. If the recombination rate is high, if there's enough recombination, then what goes on more or less when selects on genes, and this is the traditional thing that those of you taking um, biology classes probably learn, is that the selection on this gene, this version of this gene, this version of this gene. But of course, if there were no recombination at all, one would select on the whole genome. Right? The genes are all tied together. So somewhere between there is the, the balance um, between it. And at least the theoretical thing so far suggests that the amount of sex is roughly optimal when you, the, into the boundary between when you're selecting on genes and when you're selecting on genes. So that's, I say, something which is not, uh, um, um, is not uh, uh, substantial. So talking about how genes interact with each other and so on brings one to some fundamental um, questions at which we can no longer say, OK, we're just going to take the fitness as a function of the genome and then go and calculate. We have to start asking what, where things come from. So this, of course, depends on the biological organization and on the evolutionary history. Okay, so the view of most uh, biologists is that one can have a mechanistic understanding, certainly of something as simple as E. coli or yeast, 
of the functions of the genes and modules of interacting genes in there, and one should be able to understand things in terms of uh, those, and that's uh, how the um, biology architecture is structured. Another way of thinking is it's just a complicated network of interactions within the cell. Some of them are functional, a lot of them are accidental, different limiting processes, serial and parallel, and so on. So the question is, is it possible to really get a mechanistic understanding of what's going on? And I would say all of the hints from the evolution experiments suggest that it's not. That you cannot go and try to make a certain amount of predictive understanding of the, um, of the facts of mutations and whether they're good or not. There are an enormous number of different combinations that can do similar things, and that plays an important role. And part of that, and a crucial part, is just <coughs> that which mutations are beneficial is going to depend on the environment, the current genome, the past history, and everything. Okay? And there's going to be sums of positive and negative effects. And so once they're there, to tell whether the sums and positive effects are going to end up with plus 5% or minus 2% net effect, as far as the change in fitness, you know, is intrinsically hard. We, are, we can't do that in simple problems of solid state um, and solid state. Okay, so now we've um, thought to talk about the effects on the environment. So far we've ignored that uh, um, entirely. So I want to now, um, just uh, um, towards the, the end here, go to think about a bit about the coupling of evolution and the, uh, and the culture. So we have a population of organisms interacting with the environment. The mutations give us different phenotypes. We evolve and we get different populations. But then what happens is this new population can change the environment. And bacteria do this all the time. We do it a lot now. Um, that will give us a modified popu population, then we'll go around this, uh, around this cycle. So we can't really talk about the, um, this, this part of it here um, independent of, uh, of that. So one of the questions is whether this complicated um, ecological dynamics can give evolution that tends to continue. Can it give something which intrinsically will tend to give extensive diversity? Right? These are some fundamental questions that we don't, uh, we don't know. And even sort of framing them in a, in a more careful way is not quite clear how to do that and how to deal with them in other models that are useful for that is something we're trying to do, I'm trying to do now. So I want to ask, uh, um, uh, try to say something about this. But first, how much of this can we see the lack of this whole uh, um, um, eco-evo uh, um, cosmic feedback? Do we need something complicated or is it sort of inevitable? So if we just start with a single clone, like the experiments I already uh, mentioned, and then with things are well mixed, so there's no spatial structure, so a lot of the possibility for ecology isn't, uh, um, isn't there, um, and ask what happens. And this was done by Finkel and Coulter some time ago. They just sealed the E. coli in a test tube, shook it, um, let it give it some oxygen and a bit of uh, water, and it just has to live, learn how to live all to learn how to live off the dead other E. coli. And what they find is that the evolution just keeps on going. And this is a, an old-fashioned way of finding out what uh, happens, of just playing out colonies and looking at the development of those. These are different types, and they developed over a course of a year. It's still going after two years. Things are still alive. It's gradually turning over more and more slowly, but evolving more and more different things. So this has the full processes of diversification, the evolution of diversification, the changing of the ecology from other things that have happened because of change of the environment and so on. You start with one clone. You start with one clone. This is uh, identified by sequencing. Yeah, no. So this is done way before any sequencing. So people are going to go back and try to identify the sequencing. So this is, you just plate them out and you look for different colony morphologies. And these oh, are identified just by that. Yeah. So there's truly much, much more diversity actually there than is seen in this. In the simple experiments, there are also things like uh, um, um, like this scene. Um, the ones I'm not showing, but you can look at in a more controlled experiment and see which mutations, what kind of mutations come in, and how does the fitness uh, um, um, increase. One finds that it's very sensitive to details of the conditions. That's one of the things that makes it unpredictable. Right? Um, it's very conditional on which previous mutations have occurred, so the mutations are interacting. Uh, if you're in a rich environment like the one I just showed, the ecology develops very fast. They change the environment very fast. If the simple conditions, like this 60,000 generation experiment I showed, that funny thing going on in the middle, it also changes in the environment due to the bacteria that have been evolved so far. So the environment is changing from the evolution of the other ones. So one of the most important lessons from here, and if you don't go away with anything else, it's what I hope you will go away with, is this word should be almost banned. It, it's extremely misleading, and it's extremely misleading because one thinks it's a singular term, even though it ends in two S's. 
Okay? I am strongly against using ohms for things or ohmics, but this is one I think where at least would give the right flavor. Is the fit, it's a complicated function of a lot of quantities, it's time dependent and so on. And thinking of, as soon as one gets away from thinking of it as one quantity, the better. Okay. So I'm going to just let Joey the toy model where I'm going to treat this as a complicated function. And the other one is we can't solid, separate the ecology and evolution, so we may as well embrace them right? if we can't uh, deal with them separately. So in other ways, as a theorist, that one can try to make some progress at the level of toy model. So this is really stepping way back from experiment and saying, can I make some, hope to make some use of the complexities of biology in order to, to at least think or give guide some thinking from uh, um, uh, using models and sort of heuristic you know, arguments. So what is one of the fundamental features of biology? Fundamental feature of biology is it's very high dimension. Okay? The, spe the genotype space is very high dimensional. That codes for the molecular phenotype, the properties of all the proteins. The dimension of that's huge, very large number of proteins. The molecular scale and phenotype codes for the organismic properties at the cell level. That's very high dimension, all the ways in which it interacts with the environment, all the ways it infects the environment, how it will grow in different conditions. <coughs> but it's much less than the dimension of the molecular scale, that's the high redundancy, which means in principle there are many different ways the organism can evolve, have the same different organism. And then there's the space of the environment, for bacteria, they interact primarily via chemicals, but through an enormous number of chemicals in the environment. So that's again a high dimensional, um, a high dimensional. Okay. So how do we model that? Well, here we go back to Wigner, and we say that let's look at things which have a lot of uh, complexity. And if we have a lot of things which are complex, sums of positive and negative things, what do we do? We treat them as being uh, um, uh, treat, treat them as being random as a first approximation. Right? Sums of positive and negative effects that effectively can look random. And the classic example of this is the, the Bigners. The first one is, is on, on nuclear energy levels. Um, when, there, when there are many of them, the treating them from random matrix theory and all the developments that have come from. So the key character to then is to approximate the complexity by the, uh, um, by the random matrix. And then we're going to look at the evolution in a organismic uh, a phenotype space. So I don't want to look at the evolution of the genomes. I would really like to look at the properties that couple to the environment and affect the evolution, and that's the organic properties. So it's in a d-dimensional space. I'm going to make things really simple for now. Fixed environment. So I now have a fitness function, a function of phenotype, a function of X, the, which is then a landscape. I've got a clonal population. I'm assuming the population is small enough, the mutation rate small enough, that it's like my staircase model, but we're going up one step at a time. This is now a continuous space. That takes over and it's going up um, gradually. So then, then basically the, the evolution is deterministically uphill. It's just gradually going up this, uh, um, up this landscape. But I have to think about the dynamics in high dimensional landscapes. And high dimensional landscapes are very different than landscapes on which you can sketch, which for me is only two dimensional. Some people can sketch three dimensional ones. And they're intrinsically different. They have exponentially many in the dimension, maximum and saddle points. The saddle points, of course, control which maxima the, uh, um, the flows will go to when they're going uphill. There are saddle points of all indices. Here's ones controlling some of the flow, but which way they go around the saddle points, and there's the flow in. Uh, um. But a feature which is different in high dimensions, in low dimensions, you also have the saddle points, but in not too long, the, an uphill flow will start getting near to one of the maxima, no longer be controlled by the um, saddle points, and, and converge that maxima. But when you're very high dimension, that doesn't happen. You just keep wandering around the saddles, you gradually slow down, you gradually get higher, um, uh, higher up in the um, landscape, but you don't really commit to any, uh, um, any maximum. So this already is a somewhat different picture of what the dynamics should look like, even in a constant run. But this is, you know, this is still what we were doing before, this is in some landscape, which is fixed. Right? I've got no effects here of the time dependence or change in the but now I want to do a toy model of something which is like the 60,000 generation evolution experiment. The bacteria in a constant environment, as far as the external control by the experimentalists, but the bacteria are changing the chemistry of the environment each day. Okay? And so as they're doing that, they're slightly changing the environment, and the new ones, any new mutation has to come in that slightly modified environment. So what I want to do is I want to now look at a model where the fitness is a function of the 
the phenotype, the organism properties, and the environment. Okay? And the fitness here really is the differential growth rate. If you're higher fitness than environment, you grow faster, and you'll take over. And the environment's high dimensional as well. However, if I have a population that comes in and takes over the environment, take, takes over the, the population, that, that uh, um, phenotype, then that will make the environment some particular function of that phenotype. If it was a slightly different than properly those organisms, it would be slightly different. Okay. So if I have a one population that's there, that are all identical, they will give rise to some environment which is a function. Yeah. The high dimensionality of the environment is not due to any spatial variation. No, this is really high dimension. Right, this is high dimension because the total number of properties of the organisms that matter is very, very large. So I can just, I can make a list. I take every protein and I look at the, um, every protein that it's on and off rate combined with other proteins and, and DNA and so on, and that's my molecular phenotype. Then the organismic phenotype, I, I look at everything I can vary. How does it grow as a function of other properties? What does it secrete? Um, as a function of the properties and so on, and again, it's a very, very large set of, uh, set of No spatial structure at all. So we're, we're going to the least good situation for anything interesting to happen. But if you have spatial structure, you can evolve something here, something there. They can go from different directions. You end up with two species. <coughs> if you mix them back together again, you know, if they were pretty similar, you'd think, okay, one's going to wipe out the other. So the least likely situation for getting the interesting things going on is where you, um, everything's uh, so what happens? Well, we now get a new mutation that comes into this environment. And then if that's a good mutation, it'll come in, it takes over the environment, and changes the environment. Okay. And then the next mutation has to come in this new environment. So they're each slightly changing the environment. So we call this a, a snowscape model. You know, it's like walking on snow. You step upwards. But some fraction of time, when you step upwards, the snow slides a bit. Hopefully, you don't make a major avalanche. So you're thinking you're always going up. Right? You're always taking steps, but you're not actually going in. And in fact, there's no absolute sense of the fitness in this model. It's always the fitness in the given environment. And if you're coming in to someone else who made the environment, that's going to be different than them coming into an environment that you made. Because right? it's a different environment. There's a, a pr dimensionless parameter, which is sort of how strong this snowscape effect is, how strong the feedback is, which for the very long experiment I talked about would be very small, um, is a strong effect in, in, the, in the one where the bacteria will all evolving to feed off the remains of the others. So let's now look at it in terms of a sort of landscape picture. So here's a saddle, a two-dimensional one, because that's what I can draw. Okay. Then there's a, an evolution that goes around the uh, saddle. Um, of course, if it came a different way, we'll go the way around. Okay. Now if I've got a little bit of feedback, so there it's now coming towards this, but now the saddle is moving a bit because of the effects of that evolution of the green arrow, and now it's going around the other direction. Okay. So this is how it's changing as to where it goes. Okay, so that effect can clearly be there qualitatively, but if delta is small, you might think this is a small effect. It'll change a bit where it goes, but not much more. But the rather surprising result, at least to me, was that in high dimensions, any arbitrarily small feedback will make it continue to evolve forever without slowing down. So the fitness will sort of go up. You'll get up the mountain to a certain point at where you're, you're sliding at the same rate as you're going, as you're going up, and then you'll keep on going. And it's Red Queen dynamics, like the Red Queen Palace in Wonderland, where you have to run very fast just to stay in place. So you're continually changing the environment by your own evolution um, in a way that you can just continue to uh, um, continue to. So the rate at which the mutations come into the population, the rate at which they come in and take over, goes roughly to a constant, slows down initially, then goes to a constant. But this goes into a state of deterministic high dimensional um, high dimensional. So this, I say, is completely a toy model. I think it's very suggestive, and I think in a qualitative sense is correct, in that it really, I do think that the right picture is that the, the evolution really has a very strong tendency to continue because of the modifications made by the population as it's evolved. Okay, and this is starting to try to get into you know, qualitative and quantitative um, uh, measurements on this is the stage we're starting to be able to do with uh, um, um, by the very <coughs> very clever experimental, um, experimental tricks. So where um, um, are we? So the short-term asexual evolution without ecology is what I started with. This is the ideal theorist uh, um, uh, problem. Um, the theory is in quite good shape now. There's, there's very nice uh, experiments. The thing which is a crucial feature, which I said we hadn't realized initially, came out from once we started developing understanding 
it was statistical dynamic for diversity, and that really appears to have some universality, which is now being applied to um, uh, populations in, uh, um, in nature. Once we put on the effects of sex, or more generally other kinds of exchange of DNA, things are much more complicated. Um, tiny amounts of it speed up evolution. There's a complicated interplay between the selections on the genes and our genomes. Large amounts of bad, small amounts of good. I forgot to say this earlier, but I gave a talk in, um, um, in Hong Kong one time at an obscure small university in Hong Kong, at an obscure small conference. But the title of the talk was, um, How Much Sex is Enough? And it made the main city newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> so that the title was much more interesting than the talk. But it was getting at this question of, you know, if sex is helpful for evolution in some ways, but there's various uh, um, positive and negative aspects, it's a really quantitative issue which one needs to try to understand. Then the more interesting parts, once we start coupling together the ecology and evolution, this is an extremely primitive uh, stage. Experiments are now becoming possible where you do the barcoding, putting the labels on, but you get around this problem of barcodes taking over by adding new barcodes the whole time. And Michael Desai has got a system working on this, um, that it looks as if one's going to be able to track and try to track ecological development for a long time. Then one could try to pull out some of the individuals that are different, behaving differently, and see, test them in various ways, see how they're behaving differently from each other. The big hope is that there's going to be some kind of simplicity that comes from, from the complexity. Okay, and the one sort of prediction is that you know, one will very generically get into having sort of continual eco evo um, uh, heroes. The question which I would really like to be able to make some progress, I'm now trying, is about diversification. So the famous examples of things like beetles, where there are a million known species, where they're about. Well, okay, it seems like a very large number, but they also live in different places, and so they don't directly compete with each other. <coughs> but by the time you go to microbes, you get ones that are almost identical, that coexist for long periods of time. And the question is, you know, why? What is it that is making somehow so many niches, or so many, the niches clearly is one of those concepts like fitness that needs to be somewhat thrown out. And, um, the, and as to what is it, you know, what are the reasons for that? Is it a general consequence of the complexity? Um, and again, it's a complicated dynamical process. That's one where I think the spatial structure is really going to be, um, is going to be crucial. OK, so where, um, where are we? So I want to draw a bit of an analogy with, uh, um, with evolution and uh, um, so on the small scale, the basic laws of evolution, we've got mutation and selection. And you know, physically, we've got uh, QED. The basic processes, the simplest processes in, in evolution of mutation coming in, taking over the population, selective sweep, and it's like sort of like a hydrogen atom, neutral variation. I didn't talk about really the whole bunch of mutations that don't do much, but sort of drift around. That's very much like ideal gases, and almost all theory of evolution dynamics has been on the neutral variation. It's very useful for sort of markers. Directly observed evolution. You know, the classic examples of moths turning color and remarkably few classic examples that are given, um, you know, sort of like molecules. And at the other end is the whole traditional theory of evolution, fossil records, the phylogeny, evolutionary theory of macroorganisms, which is, is, you know, it's a predictive science. It did amazingly well on things like phylogeny, but then the genomes mo mostly um, confirmed what was inferred from looking at the interesting properties of the organisms. And that's in a lot of ways analogous to geophysics. I used to work a bit in geophysics. Um, you know, it's a field, again, with a lot of predictive things. But we know in physics that to get from here to here, <coughs> there are multiple levels that need to be built up in between. Right? And all of kinetic matter physics. Right? And to a large extent, and I you know, mean it's almost nothing in evolution, this is a completely separate community than this. You know, hopefully we're starting to make a little bit of steps in this, in this, uh, um, this direction. Little steps also in this direction of trying to look at things coming from the environment. Again, microbes are the nicest one to look at to try to understand things a bit in uh, the wild. But there's an enormous amount of room, uh, of room here. So I just want to conclude on my last slide by showing something which uh, um, illustrates a, uh, um, uh, a general phenomenon very relevant for, um, which will resonate very well with, uh, um, uh, with physicists. Um, and that's an experiment of trying to select for something more interesting than growth rate in a population. So most experiments, you select for things growing faster than others. That's how you sort of define fitness, right, as you're going fast. But that's not boring. That isn't necessarily what always happens. So one nice experiment done by um, Mike Chavisano's uh, group was to select for yeast cells to stick to each other. 
Very simple idea. You let them sediment. So if they, stick, they sediment faster, you pull out the ones that are lower down. You grow them up. You sediment them again. So they have to do a reasonable balance between sticking and growing. So this is an experiment which is like many in, uh, um, in evolution, and which what comes out is not quite what you intend. So my um, analogy for this is a story of a, uh, um, a qualifying exam for a physics uh, student, and in some places there's a tradition of uh, asking a general, uh, a general question. And the student was asked, how do you measure the height of a building with a barometer? So he said, I throw it off the roof, I throw it off the roof and measure how long it takes to get to the ground. Okay? So he was failed, but then the professor realized he was being very unfair, and so he asked one of his colleagues to re-examine the um, student, and then she wrote the story down. It's, I guess originally it's true, uh, a true story. So she asked him, okay, what other way? So he said, well, I would use it as a ruler and go up the staircase. Okay, if you don't have access to the building. Well, then I would measure the length of the shadow and the length of the building, and I'd get tight out. <laughs> so what about something with more interesting physics? He said, well, I would make a really good pendulum, and I would measure the period of the pendulum on the ground on the top of the building, and by the slight differences in little g, I would have to be able to get the height. <laughs> so finally, she came back. She said, what about something that uses its value as a barometer? He said, oh, he said, I would go to the superintendent of the building and tell him, if you tell me how tall this building is, I'll give you this really nice barometer. <laughs> so, so at this point, she says, OK, you pass. But as they're leaving the room, um, she says, but you know, surely you know what the right answer is. And he goes, well, of course I know what answer you want, but I see no reason that I should give it. <laughs> and this is how evolution experiments, almost all of them work in this direction. And one of the very first ones of these was done by Leo Szilard, who was a physicist who I guess first realized that you can make an atomic, uh, atomic bomb. Um, and um, he did an experiment by which you have a, a container in it where you're putting in uh, food, you put some bacteria in, you're putting in food, you're then draining out the bacteria and the food, and you're you know, stirring it all around, and the bacteria that go faster, they end up taking over because they don't get drained out as much. Right? Because you're draining out in proportional to the number that are um, presented to them there. Well, that's not what happened. What happened is they evolved to stick to the walls instead. They just do something different. Right? This is related to this high dimensionality. They don't, you know, they don't evolve in the direction which you, you, you're trying to push them. They go into other direction, which has a slight projection on the way you push it. Right? But in high dimensions, that you know, typically is a very good kind of work. So any guesses what happened here? This is, oh, this is by the pictures of what evolved. You start with single cells, and then you evolve um, for some time. And I forgot the time order in here of going around these. But you get these structures like this, which start looking like sort of snow, um, uh, snowflakes. You're um, picking the ones that stick to the... No, they don't stick to the bottom, they're sedimented. So they're sticking to each other. You're picking the ones that are sedimenting, they haven't gone all the way to the bottom, but the ones that are lower down, then you grow them up. So they have to both be able to grow well and sediment. They just get denser. Sorry? They just get like heavier, denser. No, the cells don't get denser, no. That's, yeah, yeah. Nothing. <laughs> no, no, this is what happens. You get this. Okay, so you get the phenotype that does this, but what you've actually done is you've evolved a multicellular form of piece. Okay. So multicellularity is supposed to be a major transition in evolution, and even though it's something which has happened many times separately, it is still one of those things that are in the category of if you ask someone who's <laughs> evolutionary biologist, what would you consider an interesting thing to find ever in the lab, or would you like me to? Multicellularity is one of those on that, uh, on that category, certainly. However, it's a bit like human and animal intelligence. If you ask people what would you think about you know, animal intelligence, what would they consider something uniquely human? There will be examples given, and then someone finds an animal that does that, and it's, oh no, that's not quite what we meant. <laughs> and this is the same with what happened with this experiment. After the fact, people say, oh no, but this isn't really, this yeast does it, and so on. You can do it with lots of other organisms too. How so what it actually does is it grows, it doesn't separate. It grows, they don't divide, the cells grow, they form this sort of snowflakey structure, and then they fragment, they divide by fragmentation, when it gets to a certain size. Okay? If you're sedimenting a lot before growing, then it will grow to quite a big size before I'm segmenting. So it's selecting. You're selecting on difference, and you're getting a slightly different organism out, the, the, the segments at a different size. Okay. Why does it have to segment? Well, the, the stuff in the middle, if it kept growing like this, stuff in the middle would get um, deprived of nutrients, particularly oxygen, I think, probably dominates. And so it wouldn't do well when you grow. Right? So this has to remember it has to do grow, grow well and then sediment. It's in fact cycle that it has to do. So here it's evolved a very simple multicellular um, 
organism, and it's quite robust. You can turn off the selection and it stays in this form for quite a long time. Uh, how, how long is this done? Sorry? How old is this? Two years. Oh, two years. Yeah, yeah. There's some interesting things about gene expression on, on this query, I'll tell you, tell you afterwards. But the, um, there's, and there's some question about whether there's some real differentiation going on in these cells. Are there two things, two types of cells doing different things? And there's some suggestions of that, but people are now trying to push uh, um, persist forward. So the sort of, you know, lessons learned is yes, interesting things can happen, sometimes remarkably fast. We don't know whether most of the big steps in evolution, in fact, were things like that, that all are actually relatively common, but in fact, they didn't have a chance to take over through something else that was already good. They like trying to read from this morning, uh, Joseph and Junction computers and Gally Marston like computers never beating silicon because silicon's so great. It doesn't mean they couldn't be there, but they just never had it, they never controlled it. And we only see things that have been very uh, Anyway, so I hope I've convinced you that there are interesting and fun things to do as a, uh, um, as a physicist. And you know, mainly at this point, I say it really is trying to um, ask questions and some, you know, just sort of beginnings of answers on some of the, um, um, the simplest ones. But it's a lot of fun to explore. explore Thank you. So I had a question. Mm -hmm. So are the, uh, you said there are all these very distinct type of beetles, right? Right. So is this time scale being just too short for human beings to have a lot of distinct types? I mean, we have just one type. So, so what, what would we mean by that, right? So people will, who study human evolution will claim that there have been a lot of species of the homogeneous, right? Whether they, in fact, are, I think it's controversial. Um, and there was 